As an example of what I think is a very important original source, I'd like to talk about the Venerable Bede. First of all, for people who don't happen to know, who was he? He was an English, or to be more accurate, an Anglian monk, who lived and died at the monastery of Jarrow, near to what is now Newcastle, an island. No, I don't think it was an island on the coast. Um, and he died in 735. Um, and he wrote an ecclesiastical history of the English nation in medieval Latin. Um, you, you wrote in Latin rather than Anglo-Saxon or whatever your Germanic dialect was then. Um, it's rather important for several reasons. It's the first time a general sort of history or survey of what was to become England, you know, in the next couple of centuries, was written by anyone who could broadly be called the English or proto-English, even though, of course, he was writing in simplified Latin. Um, there had been a few things written about Britain beforehand, but by partly by outsiders like Tacitus in Britain and Germany a few hundred years before, but he would be approaching it rather like an English gentleman writing about India or Afghanistan in the um, 19th century. You know, he was a sophisticated um, outsider belonging to the conquering nation. Then other chronicles of the time were written by Welsh and Irish people who were equally natives. I don't think any of them was um, a rival to Bede in the sense that they were attempting to do the history of the whole of Britain. Not at that point. They did later. And also, of course, by definition, they weren't the start of the English. When they wrote about the English, in fact, the Welsh regarded them as very much the enemy. So with Bede, you focus, it's the first direct evidence by a proto-English person of the tribes and peoples who were to become England, who would form the Kingdom of England by 900 AD. Secondly, it's probably the first original source I ever encountered. In our first term as undergraduates, we had to study the Venerable Bede um, for two reasons. One, to check on our knowledge of medieval Latin. In those days, people who studied history were expected to be equipped. Secondly, because, quite rightly, the Dons thought it was a very useful source to introduce us to the Anglo-Saxon period. It would be useful when we started to study Anglo-Saxon history. Now, Bede is describing um, largely the um, conversions of England from paganism, which happened um, about a hundred years roughly before he was writing, which happened between the 590s and the 650s. Um, in other words, I think his narrative trails off about the time when he himself was born, which was probably about 660. He dies in 735. And um, his characterization of various people like Kings, Kings Oswald and Ozzy of Northumberland, for example, or the Scottish-Irish monk Aidan, who comes down to Northumberland, are very vivid. Um, and he tells one a lot about um, conditions of those days. But, of course, there are um, strong limitations which um, tantalise present-day historians who would like to do no more. Um, Bede will mention things casually, say, about economic or social life, cattle herding or something. And because they're so familiar with to him so much of every day, he just mentions them in half a sentence and goes on to more interesting things, which is religion and high politics, uh, just as we don't spend a lot of time saying, um, elaborating the fact that some character crossed a road using zebra crossing or something. We don't go on and on about that. Um, and But also he has obsessions, which are little to do with us, about how someone, some saintly person died, then 40 years later their tomb was opened and a very sweet smell came from it. Or he congratulates someone for hanging on to the jewel of their virginity, which always used to amuse us, as you can expect, when we were 18. It's not something we wanted to do, but we thought it was a marvellous thing. Um, you know, there's a lot of that. Um, he's also, um, although he appreciates and is very sympathetic towards the Celtic tradition of Christianity, he talks about the Roman tradition rather more. Um, it's To set the scene, there were two waves of um, uh, missionaries, one sent by the popes from Rome, symbolised by St. Augustine of Canterbury, who arrives at the court of the King of Kent, Ethelred in... No, not Ethelred, sorry. 
I've forgotten the name of this king of Kent, but in 596. The other, which came into Northumbria, which Bede was a native, were the Irish, who'd been Christianized. It's all very complicated. Christianized by the Welsh or Romano British. Then they decided to bring it back into Scotland, and then they decided they had a duty to evangelize the Northern English. But the Irish or Celtic Church, it wasn't actually a separate church from Rome, and they acknowledged the authority of the Pope, but they had different customs. Had in 664, their customs had been overruled by the mainstream Roman Church. So Bede was brought up in the Roman Church, and regards the Irish as spontaneous, but not properly organized, very good people. So he emphasizes the Roman tradition rather more, particularly as time goes on. And for instance, when he's talking about the evangelization of Sussex, um, he emphasizes very much a Roman mission, he describes in detail, which went down to Sussex. He does not talk, uh, but he also mentions about a sentence that when they got there, they encountered an Irish monastery already there. And he just mentions that as, as an aside. So that tells us one thing, that Irish sort of um, fairly spontaneous missionary activity was going on all over Britain, not just in the north, one thinks. And secondly, um, it's tantalising because we would like B to say more about it, to give the same at attention to these Irish missions in southern England that he gives to the Roman mission. But he doesn't, he just mentions it and then continues to focus on the Roman missionaries. So... Um, it uh, is that, that that I think is shows certain of the limitations. Um, but we were taught another valuable thing. We had some very good lectures, and we were taught to use not to take you know material at face value, not just to accept the agenda that the writer in this case Bede was pushing out, because he's a highly intelligent man. He organised his material well, but he's a man of let's see how long ago. Um, twelve hundred and between twelve hundred and thirteen hundred years ago, you can't think like that. But to unpack, to try and use what he says to glean as as much as possible from it, like a detective, to use his clues and push them further, and to put what Bede says together with other evidence, convergent written evidence or contradictory different evidence, also with archaeological evidence. Um, it's always rather troublesome, of course if you have only one piece of evidence on any particular period or any particular topic. And it's very illuminating if you can also find a totally different piece of evidence. Now, for this period we're talking about, which the Victorians used to call the Dark Ages, a value judgment in itself, we don't have too much written evidence. Bede is, of course, one of the shining exceptions. But there is an awful lot of archaeological evidence. In fact, we know far more about um, early Anglo-Saxon England through archaeology than the Victorians did, because in Victorian times they're just starting up. They had their bead, and they could read Latin better than, in general, the educated class, better than the educated class now. But they didn't have so much scientific archaeology. So one way of using evidence is to put bead together with archaeological evidence, digging up the halls of the kings of Northumberland, for example. So um, that is an early introduction, I think, to what is a very good historical source, but... An awful lot of skill still has to be taken in interpreting a historical source. Secondly, tantalizingly, historical sources stop dead when you want them to go further because the writer's agenda is not yours. How could it be?